Chapter 8 of Buffalo Bill From Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Waldrop, Waynesville, North Carolina. Buffalo Bill From Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. Chapter 8 Letters of Commendation from Prominent Military Men. The following letter was received with a photograph of the hero of the March to the Sea, General W. T. Sherman, New York, December 25, 1886, to Colonel William Cody, with the best compliments of one who in 1886 was guided by him up the Republican, then occupied by the Cheyennes and Arapahoes as their ancestral hunting grounds, now transformed into farms and cattle ranches in better harmony with civilization, and with his best wishes that he succeed in his honorable efforts to represent the scenes of that day to a generation then unborn. W. T. Sherman, General. Headquarters, Army of the United States, Washington, D.C., January 7, 1887. Colonel William F. Cody was a scout and served in my command on the western frontier for many years. He was always ready for duty and was a cool, brave man with unimpeachable character. I take pleasure in commending him for the many services he has rendered to the Army, whose respect he enjoys for his manly qualities. P. H. Sheridan, Lieutenant General. New York, December 28, 1886. Colonel William F. Cody. Dear Sir, recalling the many facts that came to me while I was Adjutant General of the Division of the Missouri under General Sheridan, bearing upon your efficiency, fidelity, and daring as a guide and scout over the country west of the Missouri River and east of the Rocky Mountains, I take pleasure in observing your success in depicting in the East the early life of the West. Very truly yours, James B. Fry, Assistant Adjutant General, Brevet Major General, USA. Los Angeles, California, January 7, 1878. Colonel William F. Cody. Dear Sir, Having visited your great exhibition in St. Louis and in New York City, I desire to congratulate you on the success of your enterprise. I was much interested in the various lifelike representations of Western scenery, as well as the fine exhibition of skilled marksmanship and magnificent horsemanship. You not only represent the many interesting features of frontier life, but also the difficulties and dangers that have been encountered by the adventurous and fearless pioneers of civilization. The wild Indian life, as it was a few years ago, will soon be a thing of the past, but you appear to have selected a good class of Indians to represent that race of people. I regard your exhibition as not only very interesting, but practically instructive. Your services on the frontier were exceedingly valuable. With best wishes for your success, believe me, very truly yours, Nelson A. Miles, Brigadier General, USA. Omaha, Nebraska, January 7, 1887. Honorable William F. Cody. Dear Sir, I take great pleasure in testifying to the very efficient service rendered by you as a scout in the campaign against the Sioux Indians during the year 1876. Also, I have witnessed your Wild West exhibition. I consider it the most realistic performance of the kind I have ever seen. Very sincerely, your obedient servant, George Crook, Brigadier General, USA. Headquarters, Mounted Recruiting Service, St. Louis, Missouri, May 7, 1885. Major John M. Burke. Dear Sir, I take pleasure in saying that in an experience of about 30 years on the plains and in the mountains, I have seen a great many guides, scouts, trailers, and hunters, and Buffalo Bill W. F. Cody is king of them all. He has been with me in seven Indian fights, and his services have been invaluable. Very respectfully yours, Eugene A. Carr, Brevet Major General, USA. 
United States Military Academy, West Point, New York, January 11, 1887. I have known W.F. Cody, Buffalo Bill, for many years. He is a Western man of the best type, combining those qualities of enterprise, daring, good sense, and physical endurance, which made him the superior of any scout I ever knew. He was cool and capable when surrounded by dangers, and his reports were always free from exaggeration. He is a gentleman in a better sense of the word, which implies character, and he may be depended on under all circumstances. I wish him success. W. Merritt, Brevet Major General, USA, Late Major General Volunteers. War Department, Adjutant General's Office, Washington, August 10, 1886. To whom it may concern, Mr. William F. Cody was employed as Chief of Scouts under Generals Sheridan, Custer, Crook, Miles, Carr, and others in their campaigns against hostile Indians on our frontier, and as such rendered very valuable and distinguished service. S.S. Drum, Adjutant General. Washington, D.C., February 8, 1887. Mr. Cody was chief guide and hunter to my command when I commanded the district of North Platte, and he performed all his duties with marked excellence. W. H. Emory, Major General, USA. Headquarters, 7th Cavalry, Fort Meade, D.T., February 14, 1887. My dear sir, your Army career on the frontier and your present enterprise of depicting scenes in the far west are so enthusiastically approved and commended by the American people and the most prominent men of the United States Army that there is nothing left for me to say. I feel sure your new departure will be a success. With best wishes, I remain yours truly, James W. Forsyth, Colonel, 7th Cavalry. Jersey City, 405 Bergen Avenue, February 7, 1887. Honorable William F. Cody, my dear sir, I fully and with pleasure endorse you as the veritable Buffalo Bill United States Scout, serving with the troops operating against hostile Indians with whom you secured renown by your services as a scout and successful hunter. Your sojourn on the frontier at a time when it was a wild and sparsely settled section of the continent fully enables you to portray that in which you have personally participated, the pioneer, Indian fighter, and frontiersman. Wishing you every success, I remain, very respectfully yours, H.C. Bankhead, Brigadier General, USA. Hotel Richmond, Washington, D.C., January 9, 1887. W.F. Cody, Buffalo Bill, was with me in the early days when I commanded a battalion of the 5th Cavalry operating against the hostile Sioux. He filled every position and met every emergency with so much bravery, competence, and intelligence as to command the general admiration and respect of the officers, and became chief of scouts of the department. All his successes have been conducted on the most honorable principles. W. B. Royal, Colonel, 4th Cavalry, USA. Headquarters, 1st Cavalry, Fort Custer, M.T. I often recall your valuable services to the government, as well as to myself, in years long gone by, especially during the Sioux difficulties when you were attached to my command as Chief of Scouts. Your indomitable perseverance, incomprehensible instinct in discovering the trails of the Indians, particularly at night, no matter how dark or stormy, your physical powers of endurance in following the enemy until overtaken, and your unflinching courage as exhibited on all occasions, won not only my own esteem and admiration, but that of the whole command. With my best wishes for your success, I remain your old friend, N. A. M. Dudley, Colonel, 1st Cavalry, Brevet Brigadier General, USA. Tallahassee, Florida. January 12, 1887. Honorable William F. Cody, 
I take great pleasure in recommending you to the public as a man who has a high reputation in the Army as a scout. No one has ever shown more bravery on the Western Plains than yourself. I wish you success in your proposed visit to Great Britain. Your obedient servant, John H. King, Brevet Major General, USA. To all whom these presents shall come, greeting. Know ye that I, John M. Thayer, Governor of the State of Nebraska, reposing special trust and confidence in the integrity, patriotism, and ability of the Honorable William F. Cody on behalf and in the name of the State, do hereby appoint and commission him as aide-de-camp of my staff with the rank of Colonel, and do authorize and empower him to discharge the duties of said office according to law. In testimony, I have hereunto subscribed my name and caused to be affixed the great seal of the state. Done at Lincoln, this eighth day of March, A.D., 1887. Grand Seal of the State of Nebraska, March 1, 1887. John M. Thayer, by the Governor, G. L. Lauer, Secretary of State. End of Chapter 8 Recording by Paul Waldrop, Waynesville, North Carolina Chapter 9 of Buffalo Bill From Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Buffalo Bill From Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. Chapter 9 Buffalo Bill's Boyhood having in the preceding pages given the scenes and conditions surroundings and types of characters that made up the theatre of action in which buffalo bill bore so prominent a part with the letters from gallant commanders stamping his career with the brand of truth it is fitting to start my hero from the threshold of boyhood and follow him through his most adventurous and phenomenal life up to the present day where he stands unchallenged as the chevalier bayard of american bordermen buffalo bill made his debut on the stage of life in a little log cabin situated in the backwoods of scott county iowa his father and mother were good honest people poor in this world's goods but rich in hope faith in each other and the result of their efforts and confidence in the future while struggling for success as a farmer isaac cody became seriously affected by the california gold fever that raged at that time a party was organized an outfit provided and a start was made a failure resulted and all comprising the party returned to their respective homes at leclaire bill was sent to school where he familiarized himself with the alphabet but further progress was arrested by a suddenly developed love for boating on the mississippi which occupied so much of his time that he found no convenient opportunity for attendance at school his parents however not having the slightest idea of his self-imposed employment as a boatman shortly after his removal to leclerc mr cody was chosen justice of the peace then was elected to the legislature positions which he held with honor but without profit a natural pioneer he hunted for new fields of adventure and following his inclination he disposed of a small ranch he owned packed his possessions in one carriage and three wagons and started for the plains of kansas mr cody had a brother living at weston near the kansas line a well-to-do merchant of that place with whom he stopped until he could decide upon a more desirable location for his family it was on this trip that buffalo bill had his first sight of a negro of whom he stood in great awe it was also while on this expedition he ate his first wheat bread something he had never heard of before corn dodgers being the chief staff of life at that time mr cody remained but a short while at weston 
when he went to the kickapoo agency in leavenworth kansas he established a trading post at salt creek valley while he settled his family upon a ranch nearby at that time kickapoo was occupied by numerous tribes of indians who were settled upon the reservations and through the territory ran the great highway of california and salt lake city in addition to the thousands of gold seekers who were passing through by way of fort leavenworth there were many mormons going westward and this extensive travel made trade profitable with these caravans were those fractious elements of adventurous pioneering the typical westerner with white sombrero buckskin clothes long hair moccasined feet and a belt full of murderous bowies and long pistols instead of impressing him however with trepidation they inspired in him an ambition to become likewise their skillful feats of horsemanship which he witnessed bred in him a desire to become an expert rider and when at seven years of age his father gave him a pony the measure of his happiness was filled to overflowing thenceforth his occupation was horseback riding and he made himself useful to his father in many ways during his early life at this post buffalo bill spent much of his time with the indians who taught him how to shoot with bow and arrow and he joined in their other sports soon learning the kickapoo language more readily than he had his alphabet being friendly with the indians mr cody at times gave them barbecues at which they indulged in their fantastic war dances the sight of which excited admiration in the youthful william it was at this time the buffalo bill first met his friend alexander majors of the freighting firm of russell and majors and he has since then been his lifelong friend writers of american history are familiar with the disorders which followed upon the heels of the enabling act the western boundary of missouri was ablaze with the campfires of intending settlers thousands of families were sheltered under the canvas of the ox wagons awaiting the announcement of the opening of the territory and when the news was heralded they poured over the boundary line and deluged the new domain those who came from missouri were intent upon extending slavery into the territory while those who came from illinois iowa and indiana were opposed to bringing slaves into the new territory it was over this question that the border warfare began men were shot down in their homes by the fireside in the furrows behind the plow widows and orphans multiplied the arm of industry was paralyzed the incendiary torch lit up the prairie burning homes and destroying their storehouses and granaries anguish sat on every threshold pity had no abiding place and for several years the besom of destruction rendered every heart on the borderland sad and despondent in this war of vengeance the cody family did not escape one night a body of armed men surrounded the cody home knowing what they had come for mr cody disguised himself and walked out of the house and managed to escape discovering this the band carried off all the valuables in the house and about the premises drove off the horses and bill's pony among them but the pony escaped and came back to his young master learning that another attempt was to be made to capture mr cody having learned of his hiding place mrs cody started bill off on his pony to give warning to his father of his danger the boy had ridden only a few miles when he came upon a party of men camped at the crossing of stranger creek hearing one of them call out that is cody's son catch him the brave lad instantly started to dash through them knowing that it was a matter of life and death to his father he was instantly pursued but eluded capture joined his father and warned him of his danger from that time on mr cody's visits to his home were made secretly and soon after it was that he lost his life dying from the effects of a wound he received after the death of his father though a mere boy buffalo bill applied for employment to mr alexander majors of the firm majors and russell overland freighters 
mr major said to him billy my boy i will give you twenty-five dollars a month as messenger and this sum is what i pay a man for the same work bill gladly accepted the offer and at ten years of age began work for two months mounted on a little gray mule bill's duties were to herd cattle at the end of that time he was paid his fifty dollars in one half dollar pieces and putting the bright silver coins into a sack he started for home feeling himself a millionaire every dollar of that money he gave to his mother thus began his services for the firm of majors and russell afterward russell majors and waddell in whose employ he spent seven years in different capacities such as messenger wagon master pony express rider and stage driver end of chapter nine recording by john brandon Chapter Ten of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace by John M. Burke. Chapter Ten. Bill kills his first Indian. Like all boys bill had a sweetheart with whom he was dead in love in a juvenile way of course he had a rival of whom he was terribly jealous one day attacked by his rival who was an older and larger boy buffalo bill defended himself with his pocket knife wounding the youth slightly the cry at once arose bill cody has killed steve gobel and terribly frightened at what he had done bill immediately took refuge in flight the teacher in hot pursuit fortunately for bill one of russell and major's freight trains was passing beyond the hills on its way to the west reaching it he recognized the wagon master with whom he had before served he was concealed in one of the wagons until night when he went to his home bade his mother and sisters good-bye and continued on with the train to the far west the trip proved one of delightful experience to the boy and on his return he was paid off with the rest of the employees when he went to herding cattle for the same firm after a few months spent at this work he started with a herd of beef cattle for general albert sidney johnson's army which was then marching across the plains to fight the mormons reaching south platte river they were camped for dinner and had no idea of danger near when with shouts and yells a band of indians dashed in upon them a hot fight followed and three of the party were killed buffalo bill with the rest of the band was driven to seek safety under the river bank keeping the indians at a safe distance with their guns it was on this occasion that buffalo bill killed his first indian being at the time but eleven years old as the cattle had been stampeded by the indians and the horses also the little party was forced to return to fort kearney after many hardships and passing through many dangers the fort was reached though several of the party were wounded and had to be carried by their comrades a company of cavalry and force of infantry with one gun were sent out to endeavor to capture the cattle buffalo bill and his comrades accompanying the expedition upon reaching the place where the fight occurred the bodies of their comrades were found literally cut to pieces and but few of the stampeded cattle were captured upon his return to fort leavenworth the young indian fighter found that he was published far and wide as the youngest indian killer on record in fact a juvenile celebrity what bearing this taste of laudation had on his future career may easily be inferred the following summer buffalo bill engaged at forty dollars per month in gold to go with the wagon trains carrying supplies to general albert s johnston's army the trail of the train was through kansas into nebraska near the big sandy then running sixty miles along the little blue striking the platte river near old fort kearney 
then up the south platte then across to the north platte near the mouth of the blue water where general harney fought his great battle in eighteen sixty five with the sioux and cheyenne indians from this point the train continued on to the great salt lake valley at that time russell majors and waddell had upon the overland trails nearly seven thousand wagons seventy five thousand oxen two thousand mules and eight thousand men were employed while the capital invested amounted to two million dollars the expedition was without adventure of importance until the south platte river was reached the country was alive with buffalo roaming in all directions and among them were found some of the herd of cattle stampeded by the indians long before discovering the herd of buffaloes ahead they at the same time sighted a party of returning californians and being between two fires the buffalo herd stampeded at once and broke down the hills some thousands of them brushing through the wagon train wagons were turned over poles were broken buffaloes were mixed up among the terrified oxen and shouting men who were unable to manage their teams many of the oxen broke their yokes and stampeded and the frantic buffaloes played havoc with the train this caused several days delay to repair damages and gather up the scattered teams when the train reached within eighteen miles of the green river in the rocky mountains a party of twenty horsemen came up they were covered at once with guns and the wagon train found that they were in the hands of the mormons who were at that time engaged in hostilities against the army of the united states it was impossible to resist and simpson was forced to submit first however soundly abusing the apostles the mormons took from the wagons all the provisions they could carry then set fire to the train and drove off the oxen the trainmen however were allowed to retain their arms one wagon six yoke of oxen and provisions enough to last the party until fort bridger could be reached it was late in november when the party reached the fort and they decided to spend the winter there in company with about four hundred other employees of russell majors and waddell rather than attempt to return which would have exposed them to many dangers and the severity of the coming winter during this period of rest the commissary became so depleted that the men were placed on one quarter rations and at last as a final resort the poor dreadfully emaciated mules and oxen were killed for food for the famishing men fort bridger being located in a prairie fuel had to be carried nearly two miles and after the mules and oxen were butchered the men were compelled to carry the wood on their backs or haul it on sleds but for the timely arrival of a train load of provisions for johnston's army many of the party would certainly have died of hunger arrangements having been made for a return to fort leavenworth all the employees at fort bridger concluded to accompany the returning cavalcade simpson was chosen brigade wagon master of the new outfit consisting of two trains and four hundred men when the train approached ash hollow simpson decided to leave the main road and follow the north platte to its junction with the south platte the two trains had become separated some fifteen or twenty miles between them the latter train in charge of assistant wagon master george woods under whom billy was acting as extra simpson accompanied by woods desiring to reach the head train ordered billy to cinch saddle up and follow him when the three reached cedar bluffs they suddenly discovered a score of indians emerging from the head of a ravine less than half a mile distant and coming toward them with great speed dismount and shoot your mules was the quick order issued by simpson who was at once alive to the situation as the stricken animals dropped in their tracks the two men and little boy crouched down behind their bodies which lay together in a triangle and using their dead bodies as breastworks opened fire on the indians with mississippi yeagers and revolvers 
killing three and wounding two ponies the redskins surprised at the hotbed they had struck circled around and sped away again halting several hundred yards distant evidently for consultation this gave the trio time to load their weapons and prepare for a second charge which they felt sure would be made the indians were armed with bows and arrows which of course required close range to be effective and this gave the little party an advantage which partly compensated for the superior number of their enemy little billy showed so much pluck in the dangerous position he occupied that simpson could not help praising him and by way of further encouragement he said my brave little man do you see that indian on the right riding out from the party to reconnoiter yes i'm watching him was the reply well suppose you give him a shot just by way of experiment billy at once extended himself and resting his gun on the body of the mule before him took steady aim and fired bully boy a splendid shot shouted simpson as he saw the indian topple from his horse struck in the side the distance was fully three hundred yards after a long parley the indian scattered and came charging back again whooping in a delirium of excitement when they had approached within less than one hundred yards the besieged party turned loose on them shooting two more out of the saddle but the indians rushed on discharging a shower of arrows one of which pierced george wood's right shoulder producing a most painful wound for a second time the red warriors were repulsed and they drew off again evidently for the purpose of resorting to other tactics getting beyond the range of the jaegers the indians formed in a large circle tethered their ponies and disposed themselves for a siege with the evident intention of starving out the brave trio about three hours afterward however the crackling of bullwhackers whips was heard and soon the advancing train was seen coming over the hill the indians appreciating what this meant and gaining their ponies rode down on the little party again discharging another flight of arrows and receiving a volley of bullets in return no damage was inflicted on either side in the last charge and the three were saved after bandaging wood's wound the train started again and met with no further detention or accident reaching leavenworth in july eighteen fifty eight wild bill had been a special companion of billy's during the entire trip and so warm had become the attachment between them that the latter gave him a pressing invitation to go with him to his home for a short visit an invitation that was accepted by wild bill End of chapter 10. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 11 of Buffalo Bill from Prairie to Palace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter eleven the boy miner billy had been at home scarcely one month before he engaged himself as assistant wagon master to another train which was made up at fort laramie to carry supplies to a new post just established at cheyenne pass he got through this adventure without losing a team or a man returning to laramie he engaged with a mr ward the post trader to trap for beaver mink and otter on the chug water and poison wolves for their peltries this enterprise was not profitable and two months after billy returned to laramie and in a few days in company with two others he started back to leavenworth when they reached the little blue the three were jumped by a party of indians the darkness saved them after a chase of several hours after losing the indians the trio discovered a cave in which they resolved to spend the night lighting a match they were horrified to find the place tenanted by 
bones and desiccated flesh of murdered emigrants without further investigation the three badly frightened regardless of cold and snow pushed rapidly onward an all-night journey brought them to oak grove and there taking in a fresh supply of necessaries they resumed their homeward march reaching leavenworth in february eighteen fifty nine billy was now fourteen years old and unusually large for one of that age his education having been neglected he yielding to his mother's entreaties resolved to attend a school just opened in the neighborhood of grasshopper falls and for a period of ten weeks applied himself with diligence and made most gratifying progress this was the longest term of schooling he ever attended and it is doubtful if all the schooling he ever received would aggregate six months though he is now comparatively well educated his knowledge has been acquired almost wholly by extensive travel and association with polished people on the return of spring the old impulse seized on billy again to seek the far west where adventure and danger incite the restless spirit of brave men the recent discovery of gold at pike's peak was a further motive for this move billy despite his years was now a man in size and in common with thousands of others he seized a pick and set out for the wonderful diggings after digging around aurora for a few days the ignis fatuus led him further up the mountains to black hawk where he settled and worked most assiduously for a period of two months without finding as much as a handful of pay dirt in the meantime provisions were so high that it took a jacob's ladder to reach the smell of cold beans billy became not only tired but disgusted with the result of his mining labors and resolved to get out of the country he had no difficulty in finding others in camp of the same turn of mind as himself and such as he desired as companions he induced to accompany him back of the numerous caravans and individuals who adopted as their motto pike's peak or bust billy and his party fell back on the latter end of the bold legend they were so badly busted in fact that the only conveyance left them was their legs setting out on these the party proceeded to the platte river where the idea possessed billy that they might make the remainder of their journey to leavenworth on an improvised raft by various means but chiefly by killing game along the way the party subsisted comfortably while they floated down the stream on a rickety collection of logs matters were satisfactory enough until they reached jules ranch or julesburg where having met a swifter current the raft struck a snag and went to pieces with a suddenness no less astonishing than the bath which instantly followed fortunately though the north platte is a broad stream it is generally shallow and the party had to swim but a short distance before they found a footing and then waded ashore everything having been lost with the raft including their arms and such provisions as they had the party stopped at julesburg to wait for something to turn up it so happened that the great pony express had just been established between omaha and pike's peak and other far western points including san francisco this route ran by julesburg where the company had an agent by the person of george chrisman who was well acquainted with billy the two having freighted together for russell majors and waddell finding billy out of employment and express riders being scarce chrisman offered him a position as rider which was gladly accepted the requirements for this occupation were such that very few were qualified for the performance of the duties the distance and time required to be made were fifteen miles per hour 
only courageous men could be employed on account of the dangers to be encountered and such laborious riding could be endured by very few nevertheless billy was an expert horseman and having the constitution and endurance of a bronco he braved the perils and duties of the position and was assigned to a route of forty-five miles End of chapter eleven recording by john brandon chapter twelve of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter twelve story of the pony express the glamour and pageantry of the crusaders in the eleventh and twelfth centuries were revived in the fifteenth and sixteenth by columbus cortez and pizarro and repeated in the nineteenth by taylor scott donovan and fremont as a resultant were the wonderful gold discoveries of eighteen forty nine in california and a state born full-fledged and armed in a day as minerva from the brain of jove among the wonderful and prolific accomplishments of western thought and genius was the conception and successful fruition of the pony express a scheme that could only have been conceived and launched amid the mountain grandeur of the western plains it could have birth in no other place and can be duplicated nowhere else the world presents no theatre for its reenactment it was formulated by senator gwen of california and fashioned and matured to success by russell majors and waddell of the overland mail coach system of eighteen fifty nine as established by congress the telegraph extended from the atlantic seaboard to st joseph and from san francisco to sacramento two thousand miles of desert intervened the ocean communications via central america occupied twenty-two days with precipitous sea voyages could this be reduced the stages took from twenty-one to twenty-five days according to the weather duke gwynne as he was afterward called suggested to w h russell of the stage line that if the time could be shortened for communication on a central line and kept open all the year a great increase of travel and emigration and the location of a railroad by the government on a central route would be the result the conference resulted in the habiliment of the pony express which eventuated in carrying a telegraph mail upon ponies from st joseph to sacramento nineteen hundred and eighty two miles regularly from april eighteen sixty to september eighteen sixty one in ten days scheduled time and the special express in december eighteen sixty with a message of president buchanan to congress on secession in seven days and seventeen hours a feat never before and never again to be accomplished this was done through a desert country occupied by prowling savages and swept by violent storms furious blizzards and blinding snows crossing immense mountain ranges and trackless wastes of sand and sagebrush grappling with mountain torrents and nature's wildest orgies the hardy riders whose watchword was excelsior always made deo valenti the scheduled time to the objective point at st joseph and sacramento until the completion of the telegraph across the continent the expectant crowd was never held in wait over an hour before the messenger waved his red flag of safety and in the next instant slid from his panting steed and hastened to the office of the company with his bag of dispatches worth its weight in gold 
during the mexican war congress added two new regiments of mounted volunteers to the regular army under orders to lay out a military road on the route taken by fremont in eighteen forty three to oregon they were to locate posts and changed old fort kearney then at the mouth of tabor creek where nebraska city is now located to the crossing of the platte river where kearney is now situated and called it new fort kearney one at laramie on the platte river fifty miles north of laramie city now a station situated on the union pacific railroad and one at old fort hall a hudson bay trading post near the present site of pocatella this was called the military route and was the road traveled by most of the emigrants to california in eighteen forty nine passing by soda springs and south of snake river to the headwaters of the humboldt or st mary's river through nevada it passed through the south pass and struck bear river now in idaho and utah the emigration of eighteen fifty diverged southward from laramie and passed green river at its junction with ham's fork through echo canyon and salt lake valley westwardly via reese river striking the humboldt lower down and crossing the sierra nevada at the truckee pass and by donner lake this was a much more direct trail to california and was used mostly thereafter by emigrants in eighteen fifty fifty one in eighteen fifty four two stage routes were established one by texas and el paso on the gila river to southern california and one via salt lake the latter much the shorter but mountainous mcgraw and company had the route on the military road from independence by fort leavenworth under a government subsidy and in eighteen fifty nine russell majors and waddell became the owners of this mail line and operated it successfully for years in eighteen fifty nine senator gwynn then united states senator from california and a devoted union man appealed to the stage company to expedite travel and communications on the military road so as to have a central line available to the north and south alike and to demonstrate the possibilities of operating it in midwinter strange to say this grand union man and able statesman went into the rebellion and lost his wonderful prestige and influence in california as well as a fortune in his fealty to his native state of mississippi and in eighteen sixty six was made the duke of sonora by maximilian in the furtherance of some visionary scheme of western empire but soon died his propositions were duly considered and responded to by that famous firm representatives of thrift enterprise energy and courage who well deserve the commendation of history and the gratitude of their countrymen russell was a green mountain boy who before his majority had gone west to grow up with the country and after teaching a three-month school on the frontier of missouri had hired to old john all of lexington missouri at thirty dollars per month to keep books and was impressed in lessons of economy by the anecdotes of all that a london company engaged in the india trade had saved eighty pounds per annum in ink by omitting to dot the i's and cross the t's when he was emptying his pen by splashing the office wall with ink alexander majors is still living venerable with years and honors a mountain son of kentucky frontier ancestry the colleague and friend of daniel boone and william waddell an ancestral virginian of the bluegrass region of kentucky bold enough for any enterprise and able to fill any missing niche in western wants the pony express was born from this conference and the first move was to compass the necessary auxiliaries to assure success sixty young agile athletic riders were engaged and four hundred twenty strong and wiry ponies procured 
and on the ninth of april eighteen sixty the venture was simultaneously commenced from st joseph and sacramento city the result was a success in cutting down the time more than one half and it rarely missed making the schedule time in ten days and in december eighteen sixty making it in seven days and seventeen hours the stations were from twelve to fifteen miles apart and one pony was ridden from one station to another and one rider made three stations and a few daredevil fellows made double duty and rode eighty or eighty-five miles one of them was charles cliff now a citizen of st joseph who rode from st joseph to seneca and back on alternate days he was attacked by indians at scott's bluff and received three balls in his body and twenty-seven in his clothes cliff made seneca and back in eight hours each way another of these daring riders of this flying express was pony bob but the one of these pony riders who has won greatest fame was william f cody buffalo bill who passed through many a gauntlet of death while in his flight from station to station bearing express matter that was of the greatest value the express was closed on the completion of a telegraph line by ed creighton of omaha from that point to sacramento city the mail bags were two pouches of leather impervious to rain and weather sealed and strapped to the rider's saddle before and behind carrying two ounce letters or dispatches at five dollars each the keepers of the stations had the ponies already saddled and the riders merely jumped from the back of one to another and where the riders were changed the pouches were unbuckled and handed to the already mounted postman who started at a lope as soon as his hand clutched them as these express stations were the same as the stage stations the employees at the stage company were required to take care of the ponies and have them in readiness at the proper moment the bridles and saddles were lightweight as were the riders and the pouches were not to contain over twenty pounds of weight there were two pouches of two pockets each and secured by oil silk then sealed and the pockets locked and never opened between st joseph and sacramento this channel of communication was largely used by the government and by traders and merchants and was a paying venture first semi-weekly and then daily and but for the building of the telegraph would have become a wonderful success every two or three hundred miles there were located at the stations division agents to provide for emergencies in case of indian raids or stampedes of ponies and at the crossing of the platte at fort kearney there was then employed the notorious jack slade a vermont yankee lost to the teachings of his early and pious environments turned into a frontier fiend he shot a frenchman named jules bevy whose patronymic is preserved in the present station of julesburg on the union pacific railroad slade nailed one of his ears to the station door and wore the other several weeks as a watch charm he drifted to montana and in eighteen sixty five was hanged by the vigilantes on suspicion of heading the road agents who killed parker of atchison and robbed a train of sixty five thousand dollars his tragic end as related by dr mccurdy formerly of st joseph contains an element of the pathetic he lived on a ranch near virginia city montana and every few days came into town and filled up on benzine and took the place by shooting along the streets and riding into saloons and proclaiming himself to be the veritable bad man from bitter creek the belief that he was connected with matters worse than bad whiskey had overstrained the long-suffering citizens the suggestive and mysterious triangular pieces of paper dropped upon the streets surmounted with the skull and arrows called the vigilantes to a meeting at which the death of slade and two companions was determined 
on the fated morning following the meeting he came to town duly sober and went to a drug store for a prescription and while awaiting its preparation he was suddenly covered with twelve shotguns and ordered to throw up his hands he complied smilingly but proposed to reason with them as to the absurdity of taking him for a bad man the only concession was permission to send a note to his wife at the ranch and an hour was allotted him to make peace with the unknown ropes were placed around the necks of the three and at the end of the time they were given short shrift and were soon hanging between heaven and earth while the bodies were swaying the wife appeared on the scene mounted with a pistol in each hand determined to make a rescue but seeing that it was too late she quailed before the determined visages of the vigilantes and soon left the vicinity carrying away as it was believed a large amount of the proceeds of slade's robberies most of the famous actors of that memorable enterprise known as the pony express have passed beyond the confines of time and gone to join the great majority in the summer of eighteen sixty one the pony express passed with the overland stage line into the ownership of ben holliday one of those wonderful characters developed from adventure and danger and nurtured amid the startling incidents of frontier life born near old blue lick battlefield he was at seventeen colonel donovan's courier to demand from joe smith and brigham young the surrender of far west at twenty-eight he entered salt lake valley with fifty wagon loads of merchandise and was endorsed by brigham as being worthy of the confidence of the faithful this secured him a fortune at thirty-eight at the head of the overland mail route and at forty-five the owner of sixteen steamers on the pacific carrying trade and passengers to panama oregon china and japan the stage route was sold to butterfield and ran until the completion of the union pacific railroad on the streets of denver daily can be seen the grand figure of alexander majors carrying his fourscore years with a vigor that would shame half of the youth of the city six feet lithe and straight as the red man he so often dominated he is noted as the last of the mohicans and only waits without fear and without reproach for the final summons to that better land where the expresses are all faithfully gathered and the faithful rewarded by commendations for duty well performed and more wonderful than the express itself is the history of the six lustrums since it ceased to exist two thousand miles of desert waste have been largely developed in a rich and valuable agricultural and pastoral region the iron horse has supplanted the fiery bronco and thought flashes with lightning rapidity from ocean to ocean civilization has crowned that terra incognita with seven states and built large and beautiful cities peace has spread her halo of beauty over the savage haunts and churches have supplanted the horrible orgies of indian massacre the mountains have yielded their treasures to the steady hand of industry richer by far than the fabled ophir and the pactolian streams have gladdened the hearts of toiling thousands all honor to the pioneers who blazed the way for this civilization with this page of frontier history the days of the pony express will forever be associated the name of billy cody end of chapter 12 recording by john brandon chapter 13 of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter 13 a ride for life 
there's injun signs about billy so keep your eyes open so said the station boss of the pony express trail addressing buffalo bill who had dashed up to the cabin his horse panting like a hound and the rider ready for the fifteen-mile flight to the next relay i'll be on the watch boss you bet said billy cody the pony rider and with a yell to his fresh pony he was off like an arrow from a bow down the trail ran the fleet pony like the wind leaving the station quickly out of sight and dashing at once into the solitude and dangers of the vast wilderness mountains were upon either side towering cliffs here and there overhung the trail and the wind sighed through the forest of pines like the morning of departed spirits gazing ahead the piercing eyes of the young pony rider saw every tree bush and rock for he knew but too well that a deadly foe lurking in ambush might send an arrow or a bullet to his heart at any moment gradually far ahead down the valley his quick glance fell upon a dark object above the boulder directly in his trail he saw the object move and disappear from sight down behind the rock without appearing to notice it or checking his speed in the slightest he held steadily upon his way but he took in the situation at a glance and saw that upon each side of the boulder the valley inclined upon one side was a fringe of heavy timber upon the other a precipice at the base of which were massive rocks there is an indian behind that rock for i saw his head muttered the young rider as his horse flew on did he intend to take his chances and dash along the trail directly by his ambushed foe it would seem so for he still stuck to the trail a moment more and he would be within range of a bullet when suddenly dashing his spurs into the flanks of his pony billy cody wheeled to the right and in an oblique course headed for the cliff this proved to the foe in ambush that his presence there was suspected if not known and at once there came the crack of a rifle the puff of smoke rising above the rock where he was concealed at the same time a yell went up from a score of throats and out of the timber on the other side of the valley darted a number of mounted indians and these rode to head off the rider did he turn back and seek safety in a retreat to the station no he was made of sterner stuff and would run the gauntlet out from behind the boulder where they had been lying in ambush sprang two painted braves in all the glory of their war paint their horses were in the timber with their comrades but they were armed with rifles and having failed to get a close shot at the pony rider they sought to bring him down at long range the bullets pattered under the hoofs of the flying pony but he was unhurt and his rider pressed him to his full speed with set teeth flashing eyes and determined to do or die will cody rode on in the race for life the indians on foot running swiftly toward him and the mounted braves sweeping down the valley at full speed the shots of the two dismounted indians failing to bring down the flying pony or their human game the mounted redskins saw that their only chance was to overtake their prey by their speed one of the number whose war bonnet showed that he was a chief rode a horse that was much faster than the others and he drew quickly ahead below the valley narrowed to a pass not a hundred yards in width and if the pony rider could get to this well ahead of his pursuers he would be able to hold his own along the trail in the ten-mile run to the next relay station but though he saw that there was no more to fear from the two dismounted redskins and that he would come out well in advance of the band on horseback there was one who was most dangerous that one was the chief whose fleet horse was bringing him on at a terrible pace and threatening to reach there almost at the same time with the pony rider 
nearer and nearer the two drew toward the path the horse of will cody slightly ahead and the young rider knew that a death struggle was at hand he did not check his horse but kept his eyes alternately upon the pass and the chief the other indians he did not then take into consideration at length that happened which he had been looking for when the chief saw that he would come out of the race some thirty yards behind his foe he seized his bow and quick as a flash had fitted an arrow for its deadly flight but in that instant will cody had also acted and a revolver had sprung from his belt and report followed the touching of the trigger a wild yell burst from the lips of the chief and he clutched madly at the air reeled and fell from his saddle rolling over like a ball as he struck the ground the death cry of the chief was echoed by the braves coming on down the valley and a shower of arrows was sent after the fugitive pony rider an arrow slightly wounded his horse but the others did no damage and in another second will cody had dashed into the pass well ahead of his foes it was a hot chase from then on until the pony rider came within sight of the next station when the indians drew off and william cody dashed in on time and in another minute was away on his next run end of chapter thirteen recording by john brandon chapter fourteen of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter fourteen held up by road agents while riding pony express another adventure happened to buffalo bill which illustrates his nerve under most trying circumstances and great cleverness in getting out of scrapes it was when buffalo bill was in the pony express service between red buttes and three crossings which included the perilous crossing of the platte river half a mile in width he rode into this station at the end of his run to find that the man who was to go on from there had been killed by road agents the night before there was nothing else for him to do but take the ride himself so bill started promptly to do so he darted away upon his double duty and yet as he rode away he considered that as his fellow rider had been killed by road agents he stood a very fair chance of sharing the same fate it had become known in some mysterious manner past finding out that there was a large sum of money sent through by pony express and this was what the road agents were after missing it after killing the other rider will cody very naturally supposed that they would make another effort to secure the treasure so when he reached the next relay station he walked about a while longer than was his wont this was to perfect a little plan he had decided upon which was to take a second pair of saddle pouches and put something in them and leave them in sight while those that held the valuable express packages he folded up in his saddle blanket in such a way that they would not be seen unless a search was made for them the truth was buffalo bill knew he carried the valuable package and it was his duty to protect it with his life so with this clever scheme to outwit the road agents if held up he started once more upon his flying ride he carried his revolver ready for instant use and flew along the trail with every nerve strung to meet any danger he might have to confront he had an idea where he would be halted if halted at all and it was a lonesome spot in a valley the very place for a deed of crime to be committed as he drew near the spot buffalo bill was on the alert and yet when two men suddenly stepped out from among the shrubs and confronted him it gave him a start in spite of his nerve they had him covered with their rifles and they brought him to a halt with the words hold hands up pony express bill 
for we knows yer and what yer carries i carry the express and it's hanging for two if you interfere with me was the plucky response ah we don't want you billy unless you force us to call in your checks but it's what you carry we want it won't do you any good to get the pouch for there isn't anything valuable in it we are to be the judges of that so throw us the valuables or catch a bullet which will it be billy the two men stood directly in front of the pony rider each one covering him with a rifle and to resist a certain death so buffalo bill began to unfasten the pouches slowly while he said mark my words men you'll hang for this we'll take chances on that bill the pouches being unfastened now buffalo bill raised them in one hand while he said in an angry tone if you will have them take them with this he hurled the pouches at the head of one of the men who quickly dodged and turned to pick them up just as buffalo bill fired upon the other man with his revolver in his left hand the bullet shattered the man's arm while driving the spurs into the flanks of his mare buffalo bill rode directly over the man who was stooping to pick up the pouches his back to the pony rider the horse struck him a hard blow that knocked him down while he half fell on top of him but was recovered by a touch of the spurs and bounded on while the daring pony rider gave a wild triumphant yell as he sped on like the wind the fallen man though hurt scrambled to his feet as quickly as he could picked up his rifle and fired after the retreating youth but without effect and will cody rode on arriving at the station on time and reporting what had happened he had however no time to rest for he was compelled to start back with his express pouches he thus made the remarkable ride of three hundred twenty four miles without sleep and stopping only to eat his meals and resting but a few minutes then for saving the express pouches he was highly complimented by all and years afterwards had the satisfaction of seeing his prophecy regarding the two road agents verified for they were both captured and hanged by vigilantes for their many crimes end of chapter fourteen recording by john brandon chapter fifteen of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter fifteen a year of adventures receiving an invitation from an old friend named dave harrington to accompany him on a trapping expedition up the republican river buffalo bill gladly accepted it and prepared for the perilous trip the two started out from salt creek valley with an outfit consisting of a wagon filled with traps and provisions drawn by a yoke of oxen it was near the middle of november when the two started on the expedition mrs cody standing in the door when the team moved off wiping the tears from her eyes and giving bounteous blessings to her beloved boy watching with painful emotions until the white cover of the wagon which sheltered her dearest treasure became hidden by the prairie undulations in the distance the two made excellent progress and met with no detention arriving at the mouth of prairie dog creek early in december here they found an abundance of beaver and trapped with such success that they secured three hundred beaver and one hundred otter skins before the severe weather interfered with their occupation having obtained a full load of pelts it was decided to remain in the dugout which they had constructed until the beginning of spring when the return trip could be made without dangerous exposure during the period of waiting the two occupied much of their time shooting elk large numbers of which were roaming constantly within convenient proximity 
on one occasion while out hunting and in pursuit of a large herd of elk while passing around a large rock projecting over a small ravine billy made a false step and was precipitated onto the rocks below the fall breaking his leg between the knee and ankle this accident always serious was doubly so under the circumstances when no surgical aid could be had nor any but a miserably insufficient attention could be given to mitigate the injury to add still further to the misfortunes of the suffering boy only a few days before this accident one of the oxen had broken a leg and harrington had been compelled to shoot the animal here the two trappers were in the midst of winter storms without a team and billy rolling in an agony which his partner was unable to relieve after discussing the situation for some time harrington said well billy this is a bad box and the only way to get out is for me to reach the nearest settlement and get a team to haul you home the poor boy though he knew well that the nearest place from which succor could be obtained was fully a hundred and twenty-five miles distant and appreciated all the terrors of a long and painful waiting alone among the hungry wolves and bands of equally ferocious indians told harrington to do as he thought best about making the trip it is no less pathetic than astonishing the devotion which is so often found among the western pioneers whose uncouth language and grisly garb if taken as an index to their true character would lead to the inference that they are destitute of that human kindness which redeems mankind and compensates our vices brave dave harrington just like cody himself big-hearted noble generous self-sacrificing immediately prepared for the tedious winter journey collecting about and within convenient reach of billy plenty of dried beef water and other provisions needful for the sufferer's subsistence dave set out on the long trip bidding his companion to be cheerful and expect his return in twenty-one days finding himself utterly alone poor billy i say poor because the facts cannot fail to arouse the deepest pity and make us sympathize with him even now in remembrance because sensibly affected by the realization of his terrible situation billy lay on his rude bed nursing the inflamed and painful fracture nothing to relieve his lonesomeness save the howl of prowling wolves peering through the mud and sticks and under the door ten days passed when one evening billy was aroused by a singular noise outside the door he heard voices and his experienced ear told him they were indians suddenly a dozen sioux led by chief rain in the face broke into the dugout billy rose up from his pallet and faced them as well as he could expecting instant death but fortune favored him as the chief recognized billy having met him often at laramie the chief at once told billy that his life was safe but the indians remained all night feasting on the provisions found there and when they left in the morning carried away his weapons to add to his suffering a terrible snowstorm began and billy knew that it would retard the coming of harrington starvation now threatened and his leg became more painful each day at last the twenty-first day dawned the fuel had burned out the suffering boy was forced to gnaw chunks of frozen venison on the twenty-ninth day dave harrington arrived at the hut with two oxen which he had driven through the snow the meeting between the two cannot be described and billy heard how harrington had braved every danger and hardship to come back to his rescue a bed was made of furs and blankets in the wagon and making billy as comfortable as possible harrington set out for junction city the sun now came out and melted the snow and they experienced no further difficulty 
arriving at junction city they sold their furs at a good price and also the team and went to leavenworth with a government mule train harrington would not desert billy and accompanied him home where every kindness was shown to the brave man who had saved billy's life soon after their arrival at the cody home harrington was taken ill and after an illness of one week died even to this day to speak of dave harrington to buffalo bill he will have something kind to say in memory of his dearest friend it was months before buffalo bill recovered the use of his leg so that he could go again to work then he applied for work on the pony express and was engaged on a long and dangerous run the condition of the country along the north platte had become so dangerous that it was almost impossible for the overland stage company to find drivers although the highest wages were offered billy at once decided to turn stage driver and his services were gladly accepted while driving a stage between split rock and three crossings he was set upon by a band of several hundred sioux lieutenant flowers assistant division agent sat on the box beside billy and there were half a dozen well-armed passengers inside billy gave the horses the reins lieutenant flowers applied the whip and the passengers defended the stage in a running fight arrows fell around and struck the stage like hail wounding the horses and dealing destruction generally for two of the passengers were killed and lieutenant flowers badly wounded billy seized the whip from the wounded officer applied it savagely shouted defiance and drove on to three crossings thus saving the stage this last trip proved so disastrous that it was decided to use a band of mounted men to patrol the trail this force was placed under the command of wild bill and billy cody accompanied the expedition they made into the indian country it proved to be a complete success and the hostiles were severely punished many being killed and hundreds of horses captured while connected with the stage line billy started out alone on a bear hunt he had camped for the night and was picking a sage hen which he had shot when he heard the whinny of a horse up the mountain he at once proceeded to investigate and came upon a dugout with several horses staked out near hearing voices within and concluding they were trappers or hunters he at once rapped on the door the door was open and by the firelight he saw eight men who he at once knew were outlaws two of these men billy recognized as having been discharged by the overland sage company billy told them how he came to find their cabin and he was asked where his horse was i left him tied at my camp down the mountain i leave my gun here and go and bring him up replied billy anxious to get out of the hornet's nest in which he found himself two of the villains at once offered their services to accompany him to his great regret but he could do nothing else than go with them fully realizing the danger of his situation he knew if he returned to the cabin he would be killed and so he decided to act to save himself quick as lightning he struck one of the outlaws a stunning blow over the head with his pistol and as the other turned shot him dead then running to his horse he leaped into the saddle and fled down the mountains the trail was so rugged however that his progress was slow and the shot having been heard in the cabin the outlaws were soon in full pursuit but fortunately billy managed to make his escape eluding his pursuers in the darkness but having to desert his horse to do so it was twelve hours before he reached horseshoe exhausted and half famished reporting his adventure to alf slade a party of ten started at once under billy's guidance to the outlaw's cabin they reached there after a ride of six hours and found a new-made grave but the place was abandoned and there was nothing left to indicate their intention to return billy was complimented in the most deserving way for his bravery and was put on the road again as express rider 
wild bill being his alternate and the two made better time than any other riders on the road end of chapter fifteen recording by john brandon chapter sixteen of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke a soldier of the civil war cody learning of the serious illness of his loved mother instantly saddled his horse and made all possible speed homeward he arrived at home to find his mother dying and he remained by her side a devoted nurse until she died under the prairie sod beneath the branches of a tree planted by the hands of the loving son sleeps the pioneer's wife and a true hero's mother weeks after this most melancholy incident in billy's life he went to leavenworth and joined the seventh kansas jayhawkers who were ordered to service in tennessee and mississippi after several battles in mississippi and tennessee and hard service there the regiment was ordered to missouri the courage cunning and woodcraft displayed by billy had not escaped the eye of his commander and he was made a scout with the rank of sergeant serving in the capacity of scout soldier and spy he rendered most valuable service to the north and was considered the pride of general smith's corps as a soldier scout buffalo bill won a great name and passed through numberless adventures while with the army in missouri buffalo bill again met his old pard of the plains wild bill who had also won fame as a scout and spy until eighteen sixty five buffalo bill remained in the army and was then detailed for special service at headquarters in st louis it was while there that he met miss louisa federici a young lady with whom he at once fell in love buffalo bill's phenomenal luck did not desert him as a lover for the lady is today his wife having fixed the date for his marriage buffalo bill returned to the far frontier and accepted the position of stage driver over the same route where he had killed his first indian he worked as a stage driver until he saved up a sufficient sum of money to return to st louis and claim his bride he was married in eighteen sixty six the sixth of march and the happy couple took passage on a missouri river steamer for kansas where their home was to be arriving in kansas cody went to salt creek valley where he established a hotel known as the golden rule house which he conducted with profit until the old desire for life of stirring adventures induced him to sell out and seek employment as a scout going to junction city he met wild bill who was then scouting for the government and by his advice he proceeded to the military post at ellsworth and at once went on duty while scouting and guiding parties he first met general custer who with ten men was at ellsworth looking for a guide to conduct him to fort larned cody was selected for the duty and to the day of his death custer was a sincere friend of buffalo bills upon his return cody was ordered to report to the tenth cavalry as scout to guide an expedition against a large band of indians who had attacked the force working on the kansas pacific railroad the indians were followed rapidly and overtaken and turning upon the regiment of colored troops they for a while stampeded them capturing the howitzer major ames however rallied his men and though badly wounded recaptured the gun but cody discovering that another large force of indians was near at hand a retreat was begun in which the colored troops made remarkably good time night approaching the remnant of the command succeeded in reaching hayes 
and cody declared that he would never go indian hunting again with colored warriors but has since paid generous tribute to their more experienced records while at ellsworth buffalo bill met william rose a man of many schemes and a railroad contractor he disclosed to buffalo bill a scheme to build a city and become a multi-millionaire out of its rise in value cody entered into the undertaking with zest selected a site on big creek one mile from fort hayes and the town was duly laid out and the first house built the town was then christened rome and a lot was donated to every one who would erect a building thereon in one month's time there were two hundred residences forty-one stores and twenty saloons in rome and lots were selling at fifty dollars each rome had begun to howl but just as the dream of wealth was about to be realized a stranger arrived in town he was the agent for the kansas pacific road and not being able to make terms with the two owners of the town cody and rose he went west of rome and laid out a town which he named hayes city as he placed there a machine shop roundhouse and depot rome was left out in the cold and cody saw his anticipated fortune fade from his grasp end of chapter sixteen recording by john brandon chapter seventeen of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter seventeen a champion buffalo hunter having given up the real estate business buffalo bill received a proposition from the goddard brothers who had contracted to furnish subsistence for four thousand of construction employees of the kansas pacific railroad the amount required was very large to procure which involved hard riding but the labor was small compared with the danger to be incurred from the indians who were killing every white man they could find in that section nevertheless an offer of five hundred dollars per month for the service made billy unmindful of the exertion or peril and he went to work under contract to supply all the meat required during this engagement he had no end of wonderful escapes from bands of indians not a few of whom he sacrificed to secure his own safety by actual count he also killed under his contract with the goddard brothers four thousand two hundred and eighty buffaloes to appreciate the extent of this slaughter by approximate measurement these buffaloes if laid on the ground end to end would make a line more than five miles long and if placed on top of each other they would make a pile two miles high by special arrangements all the heads of the largest buffaloes killed by bill were preserved and delivered to the kansas pacific railroad company by which they were turned into excellent advertisements for the road many of these heads may still be seen in prominent places marking the centre of an oval board containing the advertisement of the road so well had cody performed this part of the contract that the men connected with the kansas pacific road gave him the appellation by which he is still known throughout the world buffalo bill a record of all his battles with the indians during this period of professional hunting would be so long that few could read it without tiring for there is a sameness connected with attacks and escapes which it is difficult to recite in language always sparkling with interest but buffalo bill being a brave man under all circumstances when bravery is essential and cautious when that element subserved the purpose better was almost daily in a position of danger and many times escaped almost like the hebrew children from the furnace so justly celebrated had buffalo bill now become that kit carson on his return from washington city in the fall of eighteen sixty seven stopped at hayes city to make his acquaintance 
carson was so well pleased with bill's appearance and excellent social qualifications that he remained for several days the guest of the celebrated buffalo hunter and scout upon parting the renowned kit expressed the warmest admiration for his host and conveyed his consideration by inviting bill to visit him at fort lyon colorado where he intended making his home but the death of carson the following may prevented the visit like every other man who achieves distinction by superior excellence in some particular calling buffalo bill who had now shed the familiar title of billy had his would-be rivals as buffalo killers among this number was a well-known scout named billy comstock who sought to dispute the claim of champion comstock was quite famous among the western army being one of the oldest scouts and most skillful hunters he was murdered by indians seven years after the event about to be recorded while scouting for custer buffalo bill was somewhat startled one day upon receipt of a letter from a well-known army officer offering to wager the sum of five hundred dollars that comstock could kill a greater number of buffaloes in a certain given time under stipulated conditions than any other man living this was of course a challenge to buffalo bill who upon mentioning the facts found hundreds of friends anxious to accept the wager or who would put up any amount that bill's claim to the championship could not be successfully disputed by any person living the bet was promptly accepted and the following conditions agreed to a large herd of buffaloes being found the two men were to enter the drove at eight o'clock a m and employ their own tactics for killing until four o'clock p m at the end of which time the one having killed the largest number was to be declared winner of the wager and also the champion buffalo killer of america to determine the result of the hunt a referee was to accompany each of the hunters on horseback and keep the score the place selected for the trial was twenty miles east of sheridan kansas where the buffaloes were plentiful and the country being a level prairie rendered the hunt easy and afforded an excellent view for those who wished to witness the exciting contest comstock was well mounted on a strong spirited horse and carried a forty two caliber henry rifle buffalo bill appeared on his famous horse old brigham and in this he certainly had great advantage for this sagacious animal knew all about the rider's style of hunting buffaloes and therefore needed no reining the party rode out on the prairie at an early hour in the morning and soon discovered a herd of about one hundred buffaloes grazing on a beautiful stretch of ground just suited for the work in hand the two hunters rode rapidly forward accompanied by their referees while the spectators followed one hundred yards in the rear at a given signal the two contestants dashed into the center of the herd dividing it so that bill took the right half while comstock took those on the left now the sport began in magnificent style amid the cheers of excited spectators who rode as near the contestants as safety and non-interference permitted buffalo bill after killing the first half dozen stragglers in the herd began an exhibition of his wonderful skill and strategy by riding at the head of the herd and pressing the leaders hard toward the left he soon got the drove to circling killing those that were disposed to break off on a direct line in a short time witnesses of this novel contest saw buffalo bill driving his portion of the herd in a beautiful circle and in less than half an hour he had all those in his bunch numbering thirty-eight lying around within a small compass comstock in the meantime had done some fine work but by attacking the rear of his herd he had to ride directly away from the crowd of anxious spectators he succeeded in killing twenty-three which however lay irregularly over a space of three miles in extent and therefore while he killed fewer than his rival he at the same time manifested less skill which by contrast showed most advantageously for buffalo bill all the party having returned to the apex of a beautiful knoll 
a large number of champagne bottles were produced and amid volleys of flying corks toasts were drunk to the buffalo heroes buffalo bill being especially lauded and now a decided favorite but these ceremonies were suddenly interrupted by the appearance of another small herd of buffalo cows and calves into which the two contestants charged precipitately in this round bill scored eighteen while comstock succeeded in killing only fourteen the superiority of buffalo bill was now so plainly shown that his backers as well as himself saw that he could afford to give an exhibition of his wonderful horsemanship while continuing the contest without fear of losing the stakes accordingly after again regaling themselves with champagne and other appetizing accessories the cavalcade of interested spectators rode northward for a distance of three miles where they discovered a large herd of buffaloes quietly browsing the party then halted and buffalo bill removing both saddle and bridle from old brigham rode off on his well-trained horse directing him solely by motions of his hand reaching the herd by circling and coming down upon it from the windward quarter the two rival hunters rushed upon the surprised buffaloes and renewed the slaughter after killing thirteen of the animals buffalo bill drove one of the largest buffaloes in the herd toward the party seeing which many among the interested spectators became very much frightened showing as much trepidation perhaps as they would have manifested had the buffalo been an enraged lion but when the ponderous shaggy-headed beast came within a few yards of the party bill shot it dead thus giving a grand coup d'etat to the day's sport which closed with this magnificent exhibition of skill and daring the day having now been far spent and time called it was found that the score stood thus buffalo bill sixty nine comstock forty six the former was therefore declared winner and entitled to the championship as the most skillful buffalo slayer in america and crowned forever with the title of buffalo bill in referring to the fact that he has the record of having killed far more game than any other hunters buffalo bill who always speaks most modestly of all his exploits gives as a reason for his scoring greater numbers of buffalo bear deer elk antelope etc that the huntsmen of years ago were armed with muzzle-loading weapons while it fell to his lot to get the advantage of late inventions and be armed with the very best of repeating rifles the fact that buffalo bill makes this statement in favor of others shows how willing he is to give credit where credit is due end of chapter seventeen recording by john brandon chapter eighteen of buffalo bill from prairie to palace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon buffalo bill from prairie to palace by john m burke chapter eighteen scout guide and indian fighter after the great buffalo killing match the name of buffalo bill became familiar all over the country and his exploits were topics people never grew tired of discussing all his great battles with the indians valuable services as a scout and hairbreadth escapes were told and retold not only at the fireside but around the campfires in the spring of eighteen sixty eight a violent indian war broke out in kansas and general sheridan in order to be on the field made his headquarters at hayes city sending for buffalo bill general sheridan appointed him chief of scouts from that time on buffalo bill acted as scout and guide in all the principal military operations upon that part of the frontier he was also appointed chief of scouts for the fifth cavalry to proceed against the dog soldier indians the campaigns of the fifth cavalry are matters of history as are also the services of buffalo bill the letters of the commanding officers speaking for themselves during his services as scout 
he served directly under general forsyth colonel royal general e a carr general hazen general penrose and others these officers who had won fame upon the battlefields of the civil war many of them wearing the stars of a general found themselves ordered to the far frontier when the south had given up the struggle to oppose the indians who were making desperate efforts to kill off their pale-faced foes the truth was that the indians regarded the civil war with feelings of delight and as a blessing to them as they supposed that one side would utterly wipe out the other side and their victors being weakened by the struggle the redskins could consolidate their forces and attacking the remaining whites drive them off the face of the earth they certainly made a bold effort to do so and in the war that followed the general officers were glad indeed to have the services of buffalo bill as scout guide and indian fighter in all the operations of the army upon the frontier buffalo bill's identity with them was such that to recount his valuable services would be only to go over the pages of history the stories of his adventures scouting expeditions hunting down desperadoes as a government officer and guiding of the armies through trackless wildernesses have been told and retold until every schoolboy is familiar with them and the name of no one man is better known than that of buffalo bill early in september of eighteen seventy one a grand hunt was projected by general sheridan for the purpose of giving a number of prominent gentlemen a buffalo hunt james gordon bennett of the new york herald general anson stager of the western union telegraph lawrence r and leonard w jerome and generals davis fitzhughes and rucker with sergeant general arsh carol livingston and others formed the party immediately upon their arrival at fort mcpherson general sheridan sent for buffalo bill introducing him with flattering remarks to each one of the hunting party and telling him that he was to be their special guide and scout the party hunted over a large extent of territory killing many buffaloes turkeys jackrabbits and antelopes and greatly enjoyed their visit to the plains in eighteen seventy two buffalo bill was visited by general forsyth who arranged with him a grand buffalo hunt for the duke alexis who was then visiting this country buffalo bill at once conceived the idea of engaging a large number of indians to join in the hunt to make the affair a more pleasurable one for the grand duke on the day of the hunt buffalo bill loaned the grand duke his splendid buffalo horse buckskin joe and riding by his side instructed him in the manner of shooting buffaloes that night in camp numbers of glasses of champagne were disposed of in drinking to the great success of the grand duke alexis as a buffalo hunter it was soon after the alexis hunt that buffalo bill received an invitation from james gordon bennett august belmont and others of equal prominence to visit the east at the earnest solicitation of general sheridan bill accepted the invitation and thus it was that he entered upon the life so different from that in which he had passed his earlier years attending the theatre one night to see a frontier play bearing his own name j b studley taking the character of buffalo bill he conceived the idea of going upon the stage and playing himself and thus it was that he became an actor winning fame and fortune through his enterprises having introduced upon the stage indians as actors buffalo bill decided upon reproducing in miniature scenes in wild life upon the frontier and from this sprung the wild west the greatest exhibition ever known during his life as an actor and his career as the head of the wild west exhibition buffalo bill obeyed every call to the frontier whenever there was any trouble among the indians and at once resumed his duties as scout guide and indian fighter winning added laurels thereby and conclusively proving that through his life in cities his heart brain and hand 
had not lost their cunning or courage and the nobility of his nature had not suffered through contact with the world nor had he been spoiled by applause and praise after the massacre of custer's band there was great activity in military movements in the northwest and as chief of scouts under merritt crook and other generals buffalo bill's career was a most brilliant one during the last indian campaign buffalo bill's valuable services were publicly recognized by general nelson a miles one of our greatest indian fighters and who so quickly crushed the indians in their late rising when sitting bull lost his life buffalo bill is one of the few famous scouts who has justly won the renown which encircles his name his exploits have been so numerous involving a display of such extraordinary daring and magnificent nerve that language cannot exaggerate them general sheridan often asserted that buffalo bill had slain as many indians as any white man that ever lived it would be no credit to this daring scout if these indians had fallen without justification but since they were the victims of legitimate warfare and were slain in the performance of a sworn duty buffalo bill may properly wear the laurels and deserve the plaudits of civilization whose effective instrument he has been for the friendship he has displayed for the red man in times of peace as the noted scout is revealing to the eyes of the whole world the scenes in which he has been a participant there are a few indeed who do not care to see the wild west in miniature as he portrays it with the aid of his indians and cowboys and give him praise for his phenomenal success having produced the wild west in all the large cities of america buffalo bill decided so to speak to carry the war into africa and the result was that with his partner mr nate salisbury an actor of renown he invaded first the english capital then the other capitals of europe his enterprise everywhere winning the plaudits of royalty the press and the public end of chapter eighteen recording by john brandon